Section 2.6 Limits at Infinity Let f be a function defined at some interval from a to infinity, in other words, all the numbers bigger than a, then the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity equals l means that the values of f of x can be made arbitrarily close to l by requiring x to be sufficiently large. Similarly, if f is a function defined at some interval for all of the numbers less than a, then the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity equals l means that the values of f of x can be made arbitrarily close to l by requiring x to be sufficiently large negative. The line y equals l is then called a horizontal asymptote of the curve if uh, either the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity is l or the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity is l. So whenever we have a limit at infinity and that limit exists, then whatever the limit is becomes a horizontal asymptote. Let's do an example. Okay, let's find the infinite limits, limits at infinity, and asymptotes for the function f whose graph is shown. Well, it looks like as we go to uh, minus one over here, this thing just gets really, 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 really big. So that implies that the uh, limit as x goes to minus one is infinity. As we've seen before, that's uh, an infinite limit. Let's see if there's any other infinite limits. Uh, well, it looks like as we go to two, right? Then we go down infinitely. And as we go to two from the right, we go up infinitely. So it looks like we could write that the limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x equals minus infinity, while the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of f of x is infinity. Okay, so remember if we have a uh, infinite limit, that automatically gives us a vertical asymptote, which makes sense. These vertical lines are the lines that can't be crossed. So this tells us that x equals minus 1 and x equals 2 are vertical asymptotes. Let's look now for uh, any limits at infinity we have. Well, it looks like as we go and march on towards positive infinity, we never really cross this line. So the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is that line 4. Similarly, as we go to minus infinity, we never cross this line, which is at 2. So the limit of f of x as x approaches minus infinity is 2. And those give us the horizontal asymptotes. So horizontal asymptotes are horizontal lines. So those are y equals lines instead of x equals lines. So they are equal to the limits. So that means y equals 4 and y equals 2 are horizontal asymptotes. OK, let's find the limit of 1 over x as x approaches infinity and as x approaches minus infinity. Notice that uh, if we start plugging in a ton of big numbers for x, like let's say we plug in 100, we get 1 over 100 is 0.01. Or if we plug in 10,000, we get uh, 0.0001. Or if we plug in 100 over a million, we get, you know, pretty, uh, pretty tiny number. Because the bigger than the denominator gets, one divided by that number gets smaller. So as we plug in bigger and bigger numbers, we get a smaller and smaller number. Eventually, if we look at a limit, we say that that limit is zero because it gets so small. So the limit as x goes to infinity 
of 1 over x equals 0. Similarly, if you were to plug in big negative numbers, you get 1 over negative 100 is negative 0.01, 1 over ne negative 10,000 is negative 0.001. You get really, 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 really tiny negative numbers. So it goes to 0 either way. This should make some sense if you look at the uh, graph of 1 over x. As we go towards infinity, we don't cross the x-axis at 0. And as we go towards minus infinity, we still don't cross the x-axis at 0, but we do get closer. I mean, I probably should have drawn this like looking like it's getting closer to 0, but it never actually touches. This brings us to our next theorem. If uh, r is some positive rational number, then the limit of 1 over x to the r as x goes to infinity is 0. And the same for minus infinity, which makes sense from our previous example. If you have uh, x to the r as, it's as x goes to infinity, then x to the r is just going to be huge. So you're going to have a giant denominator dividing by a giant number gives you a very tiny number. OK, so we can prove this pretty easily by extending the limit loss to limits at infinity. You have to be a little bit careful because while you can use limit laws at infinity most of the time, you can't always uh, pass through to the limit laws at infinity because some, very often you're going to have uh, the limit at infinity not existing. So we'll see that in a couple examples. Uh, so we have the limit of 1 over x to the r as x goes to infinity I'm over here. And then we can uh, take the r and put it outside of the 1 over x by laws of exponents. And then we can just pass through the limit into the uh, uh, exponent. And the limit of 1 over x, we just calculated as 0 as x goes to infinity. So it becomes 0 to the r is 0. And similarly for minus infinity. OK, let's evaluate this limit as x goes to infinity. Well, I can say that maybe that uh, this equals the limit of the numerator divided by limit of the denominator by using the limit laws, right? However, if I were to do that, I would get a huge number on top as x goes to infinity because it would be like basically like a, in, you know, a huge number squared minus a huge number minus the number minus 2 uh, divided by another huge number. So that I can't really reconcile. It's indeterminate. Those limits uh, don't exist. They just get arbitrarily large. So I cannot split this up into uh, two different limits. I need to find a more um, sneaky way to go about this. So what we can do is try to manipulate this so that we can get a limit that we already know. In this case, we know that 1 over x as x goes to infinity is 0. We know 1 over x to the r as x goes to infinity is 0. So let's try to get some x is in some denominators. So we can do that by looking at the limit as x goes to infinity of 3x squared minus x minus 2 divided by x squared. But if I divide by x squared on the top, I have to divide by x squared on the bottom. And I'm choosing x squared, so that way I can cancel with the biggest uh, exponent. OK, so then dividing by uh, x squared, I get 3x squared divided by x squared is just 3. So this becomes the limit of 3 then x over x squared is 1 over x, and then 2 over x squared is just 2 over x squared. Similarly, for the bottom, we get 5 plus 4 over x plus 1 over x squared. And now I don't have any more x's in my uh, numerators. They're all in denominators now. I know how to do every single one of these limits. They're all going to end up being 0. 
so I can pass through now to the limit on the top. And I can pass through limit in the bottom. Okay, so we can move the limit to each one of these terms now. So I can move the limit to the three, and I can move it to the one over x, and I can move it to the two over x squared, and I could take out the two. Same thing in the denominator. Oh, little mistake. Okay. So this is kind of neat because limit of 3 is just 3. Limit of 1 over x is 0. Limit of 1 over x squared is 0 times 2 is 0. Divided by the limit of 5 is 5. Limit of 1 over x is 0. Limit of 1 over x squared is 0. And so that's just 3 fifths. So whenever you see a limit like this, unless, you know, later on we'll see that we can do a lot of these in our head, but if we want to try to get this into a form where we can actually pass through the limit, we need to make sure all of our limits exist. So we try to get uh, all of our variables in our denominators by dividing by a variable to the highest exponent on top and bottom. Let's find the horizontal and vertical asymptotes of the graph of the function f of x equals square root of 2x squared plus 1 over 3x minus 5. Okay, let's start looking for some uh, horizontal asymptotes. So we'll try taking the limit as x goes to infinity of this guy. Okay, again, we cannot pass through the limit yet because we don't have defined limits, so we have to manipulate this thing a little bit. So it looks like I've got the biggest uh, exponent on the bottom is 1. On the top, it's x squared. However, it's inside a square root. So that makes me think that I should probably just divide by uh, x. So let's do that in top and bottom. OK. so. If I'm going towards infinity, that means I'm only looking at very big values of x. So that means I'm just looking at x when x is positive, which means that the square root of x squared is x because x is positive. So I could just write this that this is 2x squared plus 1 over x squared. That's going to be the same thing as the x when I take square root of x squared. Okay, so now I can pass through the limit in top and bottom because when I cancel out the x squareds, I get 2 plus 1 over x squared on top and 3 minus 5 over x in the bottom, which are all limits that I know how to do. So now I put the limit inside.
limit of 2 is 2, limit of 1 over x squared is 0, limit of 3 is 3, and limit of 1 over x is 0. So this just becomes square root of 2 plus 0 over 3 minus 5 times 0, which is uh, just 3. So this is square root of 2 over 3. Okay, so that tells us that y equals square root of 2 over 3 is a horizontal asymptote. I'll use HA for short. Let's look now for uh, any other horizontal asymptote, which could happen at minus infinity. So let's take that limit. Okay, we have to be a little bit careful here. We still want to try dividing by x. However, we're now approaching negative infinity. So we're doing uh, very negative numbers. So it's not going to be as easy to put x inside of the square root. Because if we're approaching all these negative numbers, then the square root of x squared does not equal x. In fact, because uh, x has to end up becoming a negative number because we're thinking about all of these really, really negative numbers. If we took x and we squared it and then we took the square root, we'd have a positive number in the end. So in order to compensate for that, we have to take x, square it, take the square root, and then make it negative, and that will be equal to x. So that means that I could take this limit where the minus square root of x squared is just x because we're looking at very negative values of x. Okay, now I can simplify this a little bit. I can put that x squared inside the square root and leave the negative outside. And now I can pass through the limit. Okay, so this becomes minus square root of 2 plus the limit when I pass the limit inside. Limit of 2 is just 2, so I'm just simplifying that quickly. And then for the limit of 3 minus 5 over x, we can pass that through that limit also. Okay, so the limit of 1 over x squared is 0, the limit of 1 over x is 0, so we have square root of 2 over 3, but we also have a minus. So it's minus square root of 2 over 3. So that means that we also have a horizontal asymptote at minus square root of 2 over 3. Okay, uh, we're halfway done. We still have to find any vertical asymptotes. So that means that we want to try to figure out where this thing is going to become infinity or minus infinity. Usually that happens when uh, the denominator becomes really, 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 really tiny. So let's see where this thing is going to be equal to 0. Well, the denominator is 3x minus 5, so it looks like that will happen at 5 thirds. So let's look at those limits. Let's look at 5 thirds from the right. As we approach 5 thirds from the right, we can see that uh, we're looking at positive uh, denominator. The numerator is not 0. It's actually a fixed number. So we have some number divided by 
a really, really, really tiny positive number. So dividing by a very small number gives us a very big number. It's like one over one millionth ends up canceling and giving you a million. So the smaller we get in the denominator, it's still staying positive because we're approaching from the right. So this thing ends up becoming infinity or it just gets arbitrarily large, we could say. Similarly, as we approach five thirds from the left, we get minus infinity because the denominator becomes negative, but it becomes a very, very tiny negative number and some non-zero number in the numerator. So that becomes a very large negative number. So in any case, either of these facts tell us that 5 thirds is a vertical asymptote. Okay, if we were to look at a graph of this thing, we could confirm everything that we've done. It should look something like this if you use like a calculator or something. Where uh, our horizontal asymptotes are at y equals rad 2 over 3 and at y equals minus, oops, minus rad 2 over 3 and then we have one vertical asymptote over here at x equals 5 thirds. Let's do some more examples. Let's compute the limit of the square root of x squared plus 1 minus x as x goes to infinity. Okay, so again, let's try to get this to a form where we can actually pass through our limit inside. So this thing is the limit of square root x squared plus 1 minus x. And it's got a square root inside. So you might think, hey, why don't I try to just, you know, rationalize this and see what happens. So let's do that. Multiply by top and bottom by the conjugate. Mm, a little bit too big for my square root. Okay, so I just changed the minus x to a plus x and multiply top and bottom by it in order to get rid of my radical in the numerator. So when we multiply it out, we should get the numerator becomes x squared plus 1 minus x squared. And the denominator has square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. Okay, so it looks like x squared minus x squared cancel, so I just have the limit of 1 over square root of x squared plus 1 plus x. Well, the limit of 1 over x as x goes to infinity is 0. 1 over square root of x squared plus 1 plus x is the same thing, except they're just adding even more. So the denominator grows even bigger. So if 1, if one over x went to uh, 0 because x was too big, then this thing is definitely going to 0 because the denominator is even bigger. So this limit is 0. I don't even have to pass through my limit. Okay, for the next one, we have the limit of arctangent of 1 over x minus 2 as x goes to 2 from the right. Remember that arctangent is the exact same thing as tan inverse. Let's let uh, uh, some variables substitute in for this 1 over x minus 2. 
because I think that we could probably deal with the limit of uh, tangent more easily than, uh, sorry, arc tangent more easily than arc tangent of something else. So let's let t equal one over x minus two. Okay, so now we want to see what happens as x goes to two from the right because we're going to do a substitution, so we're going to replace the uh, limit with an alternative limit in terms of t. So as x goes to 2 from the right, we have a uh, very tiny number in our denominator. Remember that when we divide by a small number, we get a big number. And it's going to be positive because we're going from the right, so that tells us that t goes to infinity. You can think of it as the limit of 1 over x minus 2 as x approaches 2 from the right is infinity. Okay, so now let's take a look at arctangent itself. If we were to look at a graph, it would look something like this, where we have asymptotes at y equals pi over 2 and y equals minus pi over 2. Okay, so this is y equals arc tangent or tan inverse. So it looks like as we approach um, infinity or as the t values or x values get arbitrarily large, we get to uh, a limit of pi over 2 over here. Because as we get bigger and bigger, we still never pass that line pi over 2. So that means that this implies that the limit as x goes to 2 from the right of arc tangent of 1 over x minus 2 with our substitution becomes the limit as t goes to infinity x goes to uh, 2 from the right as t goes to infinity of arc tangent of t, which we just said is pi over 2. So sometimes it can be easier to do a substitution to make a function into something that we already recognize. Let's do another example of that with uh, e to the x. So we can again let t equal 1 over x to make this look simpler. Okay, so then we want to replace the limit. So as x goes to 0 from the left, well, as x goes to 0 from the left, we get a very tiny number in our denominator. However, from the left, it'll be a negative number. So that means t approaches negative infinity. And if I look at the graph of e to the x, you might recall that it starts off near 0 the farther you are left, and then it gets arbitrarily large. So it's got this asymptote on the bottom at y equals 0. It never passes 0. So that means as we go to the left infinitely, we uh, approach a value of 0. So we can write our limit as x approaches 0 from the left of e to the 1 over x is the same thing as the limit as x approaches minus infinity of e to the t, which is 0. Okay, uh, let's look at sine of x as x goes to infinity. So if I have a graph, sine of x, let's do a very bad graph. Okay, good, nice and bad. And we want to see what's happening as we go towards infinity. Well, as we go towards infinity, Notice this thing's just going to keep going up and down and up and down and up and down right off my page. If it leveled off somewhere, then I could say that there's a limit. 
but it never levels off at 1 or at minus 1 or any value in between. In fact, it just keeps hitting all of those values infinitely often. It never approaches any specific value. So because it keeps hitting all of the values that it hits from minus 1 to 1 infinitely often, all right, whatever, I'll take that. The limit of sine of x as x goes to infinity does not exist. OK, let's take a look at these limits. The limit of x cubed as x goes to infinity and the limit of x cubed as x goes to minus infinity. Notice if I plug in uh, some big numbers as we get closer, well, as we get bigger and bigger, you know, I don't want to say closer to infinity because infinity is not a number. So if I plug in, let's say, 10 and I cube it, I get 1,000. 100 cubed, I get a million. 1,000 uh, cubed, I get a billion. So it looks like the bigger number we plug in, you know, cubing it just ends up making it even bigger. So we could say that the limit. of x cubed is just arbitrarily large, so we just write it equals infinity. Similarly, if we plug in some large negative values and we cube them, we just get even larger negative values. So the limit of x cubed as x goes to minus infinity is minus infinity. OK, so you might be tempted now, for example, 10 to just say, OK, make this the limit of x squared as x goes to infinity minus the limit of x as x goes to infinity, just split the limit. And then you would get uh, infinity minus infinity. And you could say, OK, well, that must be 0. However, you can't really do that, because x squared going towards infinity and x going towards infinity are slightly different. x squared, when you square a number and you look at it versus looking at a number without squaring it, even though they're both big, the square is much bigger than the other one. So that's another reason why we don't say infinity is a number. You can't just treat it like a number and start subtracting and canceling out infinities, because in fact, one of these will be uh, will outpace the other one. We can see this by factoring. If we do the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared minus x, that's the same as the limit of x times x minus 1 by factoring out the x. And then notice, if we have a very big number here, we have a very big number minus 1 here. That means a big number times a big number, well, that has to be bigger. So this limit actually equals infinity. Whereas if you had just tried to split the limit and then subtract, you would have gotten 0, which is wrong. The limit does get arbitrarily large. It does not go to zero. So you have to be very careful passing through limits and using the limit laws at infinity. They do not always apply. It's usually safer to do products and quotients than it is to do uh, addition and subtraction. OK, let's take a look at the limit of x squared plus x over 3 minus x as x goes to infinity. Uh, again, you want to try to get rid of x is in our numerator. OK, so we can try dividing. If we divide by x, that should be sufficient, because notice we'll see in the top that we'll get x plus 1. Oops. And in the bottom, we'll get 3 over x minus 1. 3 over x, as we go towards infinity, is just 0, because uh, the denominator gets arbitrarily large. So dividing by a giant number gives you nothing, pretty much, as you go get large enough. Then you know subtracting 1 doesn't make that much of a, a difference. We just have minus 1 in our denominator. However, in our numerator, we have an arbitrarily large number. So we have a giant number divided by minus 1. Giant positive number divided by minus 1. So it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and negative.
Okay, I'll sketch the graph of uh, this polynomial by finding its intercepts and its limits as x goes to infinity and as x goes to minus infinity. So first let's look for the uh, y-intercept, which is when x is 0. So we plug in 0 for x. We get minus 2 to the 4th times 1 to the 3rd times minus 1. And that equals minus 16. That's our y-intercept. Okay, for our x-intercept, we want to see when y is 0. Well, if y is 0, that means that x must have been 2 for this one, minus 1 for that one, and 1 for that one. Right? Any of those give us 0 when we multiply through. So x equals 2, minus 1, or 1. Those guys are x-intercepts. Okay, we want to find uh, limits as x goes to infinity and as x goes to minus infinity. Right, it got to equal infinity. If we look at an arbitrarily large number times an arbitrarily large number times an arbitrarily large number, then we get an arbitrarily large number. And similarly, well, in this case, to be a little more careful, this is going to be an arbitrarily large positive number because it has an even exponent. This will be an arbitrarily large negative number because we're going towards negative infinity, and then we cube it, which means it stays negative. This one also is going to be arbitrarily large negative. So that means that these two guys, our two negatives, cancel out and become positive. So it looks like we have a negative, a negative, a positive. They're all very big, so we end up with a positive that's very big, so it's still positive infinity. So let's look at graph. Okay, now I've got uh, some x-intercepts at minus 1, 1, and 2. I know that it gets arbitrarily large as we go towards minus infinity, so it should start arbitrarily large. Then it has an intercept. Oops. Do this a little bit more quickly. An intercept, and then it goes and has a y-intercept at minus 16. And then it goes and has another x-intercept at 1. And then it has a y-intercept at 2, but it's even for the exponent for that one, right? So that means it's not going to cross through. I'm just going to touch at 2 and then bounce back up to infinity because the limit as x goes to infinity was infinity. Okay, let's do the formal definition now of uh, limit at infinity. So we said the limit of x as x goes to infinity equals L means that for every positive epsilon there is a corresponding number n such that if x is bigger than n, then the distance between f and our limit has to be smaller than epsilon. So what this is saying is that no matter how close I want to get f to my limit, I'll be able to do that by making x bigger than some number, which I can do because I'm saying that x is going towards infinity, so I can make x bigger than any number I want. Similarly, if we were talking about the... Uh, limit as x goes to minus infinity, that means we're talking about x being smaller than any number. So that means if x is less than n, then the distance between f and our limit has to be less than epsilon. So let's do an example for a particular epsilon of uh, point 0.1. We're going to basically say that we think the limit is 0.6. We do that by testing it and making sure that we can find a number n that'll force this thing to be within point, uh, 0.1 of 0.6. 
Okay, let's rewrite this. We can make this 0.5 on the left and right of an inequality by getting rid of the absolute value and adding 0.6 to all three sides. Okay, so let's pull out our handy dandy calculator emulator. Go to y equals, plug in 3x squared minus x minus 2 divided by 5x squared plus 4x plus 1. And we'll bound this by 0.5 and 0.7. We want the blue line to be in between the red and black lines. Okay, pretty hard to see, so let's try to zoom in where we think this might be happening. Remember, this is going to be uh, for every number bigger than x, so we just have to find the smallest number where the flip over happens, where the blue curve is stuck in between the red and black ones. So we just have to keep zooming in. All right, looks like the blue curve crosses above over there. Let's zoom in a little more. Mm, yeah, it looks like it's about to do it. There, perfect. Okay, so it looks like it's around 6.7 something on the X that the blue curve gets above the red one. It's still below the black one that was way above. So it'll be sandwiched in between for every single x value bigger than 6.7 about. So we could just go a little bit farther to be on the safe side and just choose x to be uh, equal to seven. Every number bigger than seven should definitely work. So choose and equal seven. And then if x is bigger than seven, then this thing will definitely be within the limit as we saw in the calculator. Let's do another example. Okay, let's prove the limit of 1 over x as x goes to infinity is 0. So we want to show that if x is bigger than n, then the distance between 1 over x, our function, and our limit 0 needs to be smaller than epsilon. We need to be able to get as close to our limit as we want for any epsilon, not just a 0.1 like in the previous example. OK, so 1 over x if we're taking the absolute value. If x is going towards infinity, that means we're only really considering big numbers for x, so only really considering positive numbers. So we could just say this is the same thing as 1 over x minus 0, which is 1 over x. OK, so we can flip the both sides, get x is greater than 1 over epsilon. OK, so it looks like we want to probably choose n to be equal to 1 over epsilon. That should be a number that if x is always bigger than, that'll force 1 over x when we take the absolute value to be less than epsilon. OK, let's choose n to be equal to 1 over epsilon. Remember that step 1 for each of our epsilon delta proofs, or in this case, epsilon n proofs, is to figure out some sort of candidate for delta or candidate for n. And then step 2 is to actually test it and make sure it works. So we did step one, we think that it's going to be one over epsilon. Step two is to make sure that if x is bigger than n, we want our absolute value of one over x. So this guy, we want to be smaller than epsilon. Well, let's see what that equals. If we're going towards uh, infinity, we're using very big numbers for x. So we can just think of this being positive one over x. Well, if x is bigger than n, 1 over x is smaller than 1 over n, when we flip. And I know that n is equal to 1 over 
uh, epsilon as I chose. So this is one over one over epsilon, which is epsilon, which is exactly what I wanted. So that implies that the limit of one over x as x goes to infinity is zero. Okay, so we'll end by uh, quick briefly discussing the precise definitions for limits at infinity, or infinite limits at infinity. We have a number of different cases. If uh, x is going towards infinity and the limit is also equal to infinity, then that means that if x is really big, then y is really big. Similarly, if we're talking about uh, the limit being negative infinity as we go towards infinity. That means that if x is really big, then f is really uh, small or really large negative. Basically, if the limit is infinity, we're saying that the x value being bigger than any number implies that the y value can be bigger than any number. And if it's going towards minus infinity, we're saying that the y value can be smaller than any number you pick. Okay, if uh, the limit is equal to infinity as x goes to minus infinity, that means that if x is less than any number, then y is bigger than any number. And lastly, if the limit is equal to minus infinity as x goes to minus infinity, that means that if x is smaller than any number, then y is smaller than any number.